everyone, this is Pastor Dan again from Athens Christian Reformed Church and together with the Athens Public Library. Uh, I have been reading, as you know, the Chronicles of Narnia. We're still on book two and we are starting chapter 13 today. Uh, book two, by the way, is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, of course. Now, um, remember that last time we left off with Peter having killed the wolf Maugrim and having uh, earned his name Sir Peter, Wolf's Bane. And now we move on to chapter 13, Deep Magic from the Dawn of Time. Now we must get back to Edmund. When he had been made to walk far further than he had ever known that anybody could walk, the witch at last halted in a dark valley all overshadowed with fir trees and yew trees. Edmund simply sank down and lay on his face, doing nothing at all, and not even caring what was going to happen next, provided they would let him lie still. He was too tired even to notice how hungry and thirsty he was. The witch and the dwarf were talking close between him in low beside him in low tones. No, said the dwarf, it is no use now, O oh queen. They must have reached the stone table by now. Perhaps the wolf will smell us out and bring us news, said the witch. It cannot be good news if he does, said the dwarf. Four thrones in Care Paravel, said the witch. How if only three were filled? That would not fulfill the prophecy. What difference would that make now that he's here? said the dwarf. He did not dare even now to say, to mention the name of Aslan to his mistress. He may not stay long, and then we would fall upon the three at care. Yet it might be better, said the dwarf, to keep this one. Here he kicked Edmund for bargaining with. Yes, and have him rescued, said the witch scornfully. Then, said the dwarf, we had better do what we have to do at once. I would like to have it done on the stone table itself, said the witch. That is the proper place. That is where it has always been done before. It will be a long time now before the stone table can again be put to it put to its proper use, said the dwarf. True, said the witch, and then, well, I will begin. At that moment, with a rush and a snarl, a wolf rushed up to them. I have seen them. They are at the, all at the stone table with him. They have killed my captain, Maugrim. I was hidden in the thickets and saw it all. One of the sons of Adam killed him. Fly! Fly! No, said the witch, there need be no flying. Go quickly. Summon all our people to meet me here as speedily as they can. Call out the giants and the werewolves and the spirits of those trees who are on our side. Call the ghouls and the boggles, the ogres and the minotaurs. Call the cruels, the hags, the spectres, <coughs> and the people of the toadstools. We will fight. What? Have I not still my wand? Will not their ranks turn into stone even as they come on? Be off quickly. I have little thing to finish here while you are away. The great brute bowed its head, turned, and galloped away. Now, she said, we have no table. Let me see. We had better put it against the trunk of a tree. Edmund found himself being roughly forced to his feet. Then the dwarf set him with his back against a tree and bound him fast. He saw the witch take off her outer mantle. Her arms were bare underneath and it was and terribly white. Because they were so very white, he could see them, but he could not see much else. It was so dark in this valley under the dark trees. Prepare the victim, said the witch. And the dwarf undid Edmund's collar and folded back his shirt at the neck. Then he took Edmund's hair and pulled his head back so that he had to raise his chin. After that, Edmund heard a strange noise. Whiz, whiz, whiz. 
For a moment, he couldn't think what it was. Then he realized it was the sound of a knife being sharpened. At that very moment, he heard loud shouts from every direction, a drumming of hoofs and a beating of wings, a scream from the witch, confusion all around him, and then he found he was being untied. Strong arms were round him, and he heard big, kind voices saying things like, Let him lie down. Give him some wine. Drink this. Steady now. You'll be all right in a minute. Then he heard the voices of people who were not talking to him, but to one another, and they were saying things like, Who's got the witch? I thought you had her. I didn't see her after I knocked the knife out of her hand. I was after the dwarf. Do you mean to say she was escaped? A chap can't mind everything at once. What's that? Oh, sorry, it's an old stump. But just at this point, Edmund went off into a dead faint. Presently, the centaurs and unicorns and deer and birds, they were, of course, the rescue party which Aslan had sent in the last chapter, all set off to go back to the stone table, carrying Edmund with them. But if they could have seen what happened in that valley after they had gone, I think they might have been surprised. It was perfectly still, and presently the moon grew bright, if you had been there. You would have seen the moonlight shining on an old tree stump and on a fair-sized boulder. But if you had gone on looking, you would gradually have begun to think there was something odd about both the stump and the boulder. And next, you would have thought that the stump did look really remarkably like a little fat man crouching on the ground. And if you had watched long enough, you would have seen the stump walk across to the boulder and the boulder sit up and begin talking to the stump. For in reality, the stump and the boulder were simply the witch and the dwarf. For it was part of her magic that she could make things look like what they aren't, and she had the presence of mind to do so at the very moment when the knife was knocked out of her hand. She had kept hold of her wand, so it had been kept safe too. When the other children woke up the next morning, they had been sleeping on piles of cushions in the pavilion, the first thing they heard from Mrs. Beaver was that their brother had been rescued and brought into camp late last night and was at the moment with Aslan. As soon as they had breakfasted, they all went out and there they saw Aslan and Edmund walking together in the dewy grass apart from the rest of the court. There is no need to tell you, and no one ever heard, what Aslan was saying, but it was a conversation which Edmund never forgot. At the, as the others drew near, Aslan turned to meet them, bringing Edmund with him. Here is your brother, he said, and there is no need to talk to him about what is past. Edmund shook hands with each of the others and said to each of them in turn, I'm sorry. And everyone said, that's all right. And then everyone wanted very hard to say something which would make it quite clear that they were all friends with him again, something ordinary and natural, and of course no one could think of anything in the world to say. But before they had time to feel really awkward, one of the leopards approached Aslan and said, Sire, there is a messenger from the enemy who craves audience. Let him approach, said Aslan. The leopard went away and soon returned, leading the witch's dwarf. "'What is your message, son of Earth?' asked Aslan. "'The Queen of Narnia, an empress of the Lone Islands, desires a safe conduct to come and speak with you,' said the dwarf, "'on a matter which is, much, is as much to your advantage as to hers.' "'Queen of Narnia, indeed,' said Mr. Beaver, "'of all the cheek!' Peace, Beaver, said Aslan. All names will soon be restored to their proper owners. In the meantime, we will not dispute about them. Tell your mistress, son of Earth, that I grant her safe conduct on condition that she leaves her wand behind her at that great oak. This was agreed to, and two leopards went back with the dwarf to see that the conditions were properly carried out. 
But supposing she turns the two leopards into stone, whispered Lucy to Peter. I think the same idea had occurred to the leopards themselves. At any rate, as they walked off, their fur was all standing up on their backs and their tails were bristling like a cat's when it sees a strange dog. It'll be all right, whispered Peter in reply. He wouldn't send them if it weren't. A few minutes later, the witch herself walked out on to the top of the hill and came straight across and stood before Aslan. The, tree, the three children who had not seen her before felt shudders running down their backs at the sight of her face, and there were low growls among all the animals present. Though it was bright sunshine, everyone felt suddenly cold. The only two people present who seemed to be quite at their ease were Aslan and the witch herself. It was the oddest thing to see those two faces, the golden face and the dead white face, so close together. Not that the witch looked Aslan exactly in his eyes. Mrs. Beaver particularly noticed this. You have a traitor there, Aslan, said the witch. Of course, everyone present knew that she meant Edmund, but Edmund had got past thinking about himself after all he'd been through and after all the talk he'd had that morning. He just went on looking at Aslan. It didn't seem to matter what the witch said. Well, said Aslan, his offense was not against you. Have you forgotten the deep magic? asked the witch. Let us say I have forgotten it, answered Aslan gravely. Tell us of this deep magic. Tell you, said the witch, her voice suddenly growing suddenly shriller. Tell you what is written on the very stone table of which stands beside us? Tell you what is written in letters deep as a spear is long on the fire stones on the secret hill? Tell you what is engraved on the scepter of the emperor beyond the sea? You, at least, know the magic which the emperor put into Narnia at the very beginning. You know that every traitor belongs to me as my lawful prey, and that for every treachery I have a right to a kill. <clears throat> oh, said Mrs. Mr. Beaver, so that's how you came to imagine yourself a queen, because you are the emperor's hangman, I see. Peace, Beaver, said Aslan with a very low growl. And so, continued the witch, that human creature is mine. His life is forfeit to me. His blood is my property. Come and take it, then, said the bull with the man's head in a great bellowing voice. Fool, said the witch with a savage smile that was almost a snarl. Do you really think your master can rob me of my rights by mere force? He knows the deep magic better than that. He knows that unless I have blood, as the law says, all Narnia will be overturned and perish in fire and water. It is very true, said Aslan. I do not deny it. Oh, Aslan, whispered Susan in the lion's ear, can't we... I mean, you won't, will you? Can't we do something about the deep magic? Isn't there something you can work against it? Work against the emperor's magic, said Aslan, turning to her with something like a frown on his face. And nobody ever made that suggestion to him again. Edmund was on the other side of Aslan, looking all the time at Aslan's face. He felt a choking feeling and wondered if he ought to say something. But a moment later he felt that he was not expected to do anything except to wait and do what he was told. Fall back, all of you, said Aslan, and I will talk to the witch alone. They all obeyed. It was a terrible time, this waiting and wondering while the lion and the witch talked earnestly together in low voices. Lucy said, Oh, Edmund, and began to cry. 
Peter stood with his back to the others looking out at the distant sea. The beavers stood holding each other's paws with their heads bowed. The centaurs stamped uneasily with their hoofs, but everyone became perfectly still in the end, so that you noticed even small sounds like a bumblebee flying past, or the birds in the forest down below them, or the wind rustling the leaves, and still the talk between Aslan and the White Witch went on. At last they heard Aslan's voice. You can all come back, he said. I have settled the matter. She has renounced the claim on your brother's blood. And all over the hill there was a noise as if everyone had been holding their breath and had now begun breathing again. And then a murmur of talk. The witch was just turning away with a look of fierce joy on her face when she stopped and said, But how do I know that this promise will be kept? Ah! roared Aslan, half rising from his throne, and his great mouth opened wider and wider, and the roar grew louder and louder, and the witch, after staring for a moment with her lips wide apart, picked up her skirts and fairly ran for her life. Chapter 14 The Triumph of the Witch As soon as the witch had gone, Aslan said, you must move from this place at once. It will be wanted for other purposes. We shall encamp tonight at the fords of Baruna. Of course, everyone was dying to ask him how he had arranged matters with the witch, but his face was stern and everyone's ears were still ringing with the sound of his roar, and so nobody dared. After a meal, which was taken in the open air on the hilltop, for the sun had got strong by now and dried the grass, they were busy for a while taking the pavilion down and packing things up. Before two o'clock they were on the march and set off in a northeasterly direction, walking at an easy pace, for they had not far to go. During the first part of the journey, Aslan explained to Peter his plan of campaign. As soon as she has finished her business in these parts, he said, the witch and her crew will almost certainly fall back to her house and prepare for a siege. You may or may not be able to cut her off and pretend her from, prevent her from reaching it. He then went on to outline two plans of battle, one for fighting the witch and her people in the wood and another for assaulting her castle. And all the time he was advising Peter how to conduct the operation, saying things like, You must put your centaurs in such and such a place or you must put scouts to see that she doesn't do so-and-so. Till at last, Peter said, But you will be there yourself, Aslan. I can give you no promise of that, answered the lion, and he continued giving Peter his instructions. For the last part of the journey, it was Susan and Lucy who saw most of him. He did not talk very much and seemed to them to be sad. It was still afternoon when they came down to a place where the river valley had widened out and the river was broad and shallow. This was the fords of Baruna, and Aslan gave orders to halt on this side of the water. But Peter said, wouldn't it be better to camp on the far side for fear she should try a night attack or anything? Aslan, who seemed to have been thinking about something else, roused himself with a shake of his magnificent mane and said, hey, What's that? Peter said it all over again. No, said Aslan in a dull voice, as if it didn't matter. No, she will not make an attack tonight. And then he sighed deeply. But presently he added, All the same, it was well thought of. That is how a soldier ought to think. But it doesn't really matter. So they proceeded to pitch their camp. Aslan's mood affected everyone that evening. Peter was feeling uncomfortable, too, at the idea of fighting the battle on his own. The news that Aslan might not be there had come as a great shock to him. Supper that evening was a quiet meal. Everyone felt how different it had been the previous night, or even that morning. It was as if the good times, having just begun, were already 
drawing to their end. This feeling affected Susan so much that she couldn't get to sleep when she went to bed, and after she had lain counting sheep and turning over and over, she heard Lucy give a long sigh and turn over just beside her in the darkness. Can't you get to sleep either? said Susan. No, said Lucy. I thought you were asleep. I say, Susan. What? I've had a most horrible feeling as if something were hanging over us. Have you? Because as a matter of fact, so have I. Something about Aslan, said Lucy. Either some dreadful thing is going to happen to him or some dreadful, something dreadful that he's going to do. There's been something wrong with him all afternoon, said Susan. Lucy, what was that he said about not being with us at the battle? You don't think he could be stealing us away and leaving us tonight, do you? Where is he now? said Lucy. Is he here in the pavilion? I don't think so. Susan, let's go outside and have a look around. We might see him. All right, let's, said Susan. We might just as well be doing that as lying awake here. Very quietly, the two girls groped their way among the other sleep sleepers and crept out of the tent. The moonlight was bright, and everything was quite still except for the noise of the river chattering over the stones. Then Susan suddenly caught Lucy's arm and said, Look! On the far side of the camping ground, just where the trees began, they saw the lion slowly walking away from them into the wood. Without a word, they both followed him. He led them up the steep slope out of the river valley and then slightly to the right, apparently by the very same route which they had used that afternoon in coming from the hill of the stone table. On and on he led them, into dark shadows and out into pale moonlight, light, getting their feet wet with the heavy dew. He looked somehow different from the Aslan they knew, his tail and his head hung low, and he walked slowly, as if he were very, very tired. Then, when they were crossing a wide open place where there were no shadows for them to hide in, he stopped and looked around. Looked around. It was no good trying to run away, so they came towards him. When they were closer, he said, Oh, children, children, why are you following me? We couldn't sleep said Lucy, and then felt sure that she need say no more, and that Aslan knew all that they had been thinking. Please, may we come with you, wherever you're going? asked Susan. Well, said Aslan, and seemed to be thinking. Then he said, I should be glad of company tonight. Yes, you may come if you will promise to stop when I tell you, and after that leave me to go on alone. Oh, thank you, thank you, and we will, said the two girls. Forward they went again, and one of the girls walked on each side of the lion. How slowly they walked, and his great royal head drooped so that his nose nearly touched the grass. Presently he stumbled and gave a low moan. Aslan, dear Aslan, said Lucy, what is wrong? Can't you tell us? Are you ill, dear Aslan? asked Susan. No, said Aslan. I am sad as and lonely. Lay your hands on my mane so that I can feel you are there, and let us walk like that. And so the girls did what they would never have dared do without his permission but what they had longed to do ever since they first saw him, buried their cold hands in the beautiful sea of fur and stroked it, and so doing, walked with him. And presently they saw that they were going with him up the slope of the hill on which the stone table stood. They went up at the side where the trees came furthest up, and when they got to the last tree, was the one that had some bushes about it. Aslan stopped and said, Oh, children, children, here you must stop 
And whatever happens, do not let yourselves be seen. Farewell. And both the girls cried bitterly, though they hardly knew why and clung to the lion and kissed his mane and his nose and his paws and his great sad eyes. Then he turned from them and walked out onto the top of that hill, and Lucy and Susan, crouching in the bushes, looked after him, and this was what they saw. A great crowd of people were standing all around the stone table, and through, though the moon was shining, many of them carried torches, which burned with evil-looking red flames and black smoke. But such people, ogres with monstrous teeth, and wolves and bull-headed men, spirits of evil trees and poisonous plants and other creatures whom I won't describe because if I did, the grown-ups would probably not let you read this book. Cruels and hags and incubuses, wraiths, horrors, afrites, sprites, orki orkneys, woozes, and ettins. In fact, here were all those who were on the witch's side and whom the wolf had summoned at her command. And right in the middle, standing by the table, was the witch herself. A howl and a gibber of dismay went up from the creatures when they first saw the lion, the great lion, pacing towards them, and for a moment even the witch seemed to be struck with fear. Then she recovered herself and gave a wild, fierce laugh. The fool, she cried, the fool has come, bind him fast. Lucy and Susan held their breaths, waiting for Aslan's roar and his spring upon his enemies, but it never came. Four hags grinning and leering, yet also at first hanging back, and half afraid of what they had to do, had approached him. Bind him, I say repeated the white witch. The hags made a dart at him, and shrieked with triumph when they found that he made no resistance at all. And then others, evil dwarfs and apes, rushed in to help him, and be between them they rolled the huge lion over on his back and tied all his four paws together, shouting and cheering as if they had done something brave, though had the lion chose one of those paws could have been the death of them all. But he made no noise. Even when the enemies, straining and tugging, pulled the cord so tight that they cut into his flesh. Then they began to drag him towards the stone table. Stop, said the witch. Let him first be shaved. Another roar of Mean laughter went up from her followers as an ogre with a pair of shears came forward and squatted down by Aslan's head. Snip, snip, snip went the shears, and masses of curling gold began to fall to the ground. Then the ogre stood back and the children, watching from their hiding place, could see the face of Aslan looking all small, indifferent without its mane. The enemies also saw the difference. Why, he's only a great cat after all, cried one. Is that what we were afraid of? said another. And they surged round Aslan, jeering at him, saying things like, Puss, 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 poor pussy, and how many mice have you caught today, cat? And would you like a saucer of milk, pussums? Oh, how can they? said Lucy, tears streaming down her cheeks. The brutes, the brutes! For now that the first shock was over, the shorn face of Aslan looked to her braver and more beautiful and more patient than ever. Muzzle him! said the witch. And even now, as they worked about his face, putting on the muzzle, one bite from his jaws would have cost two or three of them their hands. But he never moved. 
and this seemed to enrage all that rabble. Everyone was at him now. Those who had been afraid to come near him even after he was bound began to find their courage, and for a few minutes the two girls could not even see him. So thickly was he surrounded by the whole crowd of creatures kicking him, hitting him, spitting on him, jeering at him. At last, the rabble had had enough of this. They began to drag the bound and muzzled lion to the stone table, some pulling and some pushing. He was so huge that even when they got him there, it took all their efforts to hoist him onto the surface of it. Then there was more tying and tightening of cords. Cowards! Cowards! sobbed Susan. Are they still afraid of him, even now? When once Aslan had been tied and tied so that he was really a mass of cords on the flat stone, a hush fell on the crowd. Four hags holding four torches stood at the corners of the table. The witch bared her arms as she had bared them the previous night when it had been Edmund instead of Aslan. Then she began to whet her knife. It looked to the children when the gleam of the torchlight fell on it as if the knife were made of stone, not of steel, and it was of a strange and evil shape. At last she drew near. She stood by Aslan's head. Her face was working and twitching with passion. But his looked up at the sky, still quiet, neither angry nor afraid, but a little sad. Then just before she gave the blow, she stooped down and said in a quivering voice, And now, who has won? Fool, did you think that by all this you would save the human traitor? Now I will kill you instead of him as our pact was, and so the deep magic will be appeased. But when you are dead, what will prevent me from killing him as well? And who will take him out of my hand then? Understand that you have given me Narnia forever. You have lost your own life, and you have not saved his. In that knowledge, despair and die. The children did not see the actual moment of the killing. They couldn't bear to look and had covered their eyes. Chapter 15 deeper magic from before the dawn of time. While the two girls still crouched in the bushes with their hands over their faces, they heard the voice of the witch calling out, Now follow me all, and we will set about what remains of this war. It will not take long to crush the human vermin and the traitors, now that the great fool, the great cat, lies dead. At this moment, the children were for a few seconds in very great danger, for with wild cries and a noise of skirling pipes and shrill horns blowing, the whole of that vile rabble came sweeping off the hilltop and down the slope right past their hiding place. They felt the specters go by them like a cool, cold wind, and they felt the ground shake beneath them under the galloping feet of the minotaurs, and overhead there went a flurry of foul, foul wings and a blackness of vultures and giant bats. At any other time, they would have trembled with fear, but now the sadness and shame and horror of Aslan, Aslan's death so filled their minds that they hardly thought of it. As soon as the wood was silent again, Susan and Lucy crept out onto the open hilltop. The moon was getting low, and thin clouds were passing across her, but still they could see the shape of the lion lying dead in his bonds. And down they both knelt in the wet grass and kissed his cold face and stroked his beautiful fur, what was left of it, and cried till they could cry no more. And then they looked at each other and held each other's hands for mere loneliness and cried again, and then again were silent. 
At last, Lucy said, I can't bear to look at him in that horrible muzzle. I wonder, could we take it off? So they tried, and after a lot of working at it, for their fingers were cold and it was now the darkest part of the night, they succeeded. And when they saw his face without it, they burst out crying again, and kissed it and fondled it and wiped away the blood and the foam as well as they could. And it was all more lonely and hopeless and horrid than I know how to describe. I wonder, could we untie him as well? said Susan presently. But the enemies, out of pure spitefulness, had drawn the cords so tight that the girls could make nothing of the knots. I hope no one who reads this book has been quite as miserable as, as Susan and Lucy were that night. But if you have been, if you've been up all night and cried till you have no more tears left in you, you will know that there comes in the end sort of quietness. You feel as if nothing is ever going to happen again. At any rate, that was how it felt to these two. Hours and hours seemed to go by in this dead calm, and they hardly noticed that they were getting colder and colder. But at last, Lucy noticed two other things. One was that the sky on the east side of the hill was a little less dark than it had been an hour ago. The other was some tiny movement going on in the grass at her feet. At first, she took no interest in this. What did it matter? Nothing mattered now. But at last, she saw that whatever it was had begun to move up the upright stones of the stone table, and now, whatever they were, were moving about on Aslan's body. She peered closer. They were little gray things. Oh, said Susan from the other side of the table. How beastly. There are horrid little mice crawling over him. Get away, you little beasts. She raised her hand to frighten them away. Wait, said Lucy, who had been looking at them more closely still. Can you see what they're doing? Both girls bent down and stared. I do believe, said Susan. But how queer. They're nibbling away at the corns. That's what I thought, said Lucy. I think they're friendly mice. Poor little things. They don't realize he's dead. They think it'll do some good untying him. It was quite definitely lighter by now. Each of the girls noticed for the first time the white face of the other. They could see the mice nibbling away dozens and dozens, even hundreds of little field mice. And at last, one by one, the ropes were all gnawed through. The sky in the east was whitish by now, and the stars were getting fainter, all except one very big one low down on the eastern horizon. They felt colder than they had gnawed ropes. Aslan looked more like himself without them. Every moment his dead face looked nobler as the light grew and they could see it better. In the wood behind them, a bird gave a chuckling sound. It had been so still for hours and hours that it startled them. Then another bird answered it. Soon there were birds singing all over it was quite definitely early morning now, not late night. I'm so cold, said Lucy. So am I, said Susan. Let's walk about a bit. They walked to the eastern edge of the hill and looked down. The one big star had almost disappeared. The country all looked dark gray. But beyond, at the very end of the world, the sea showed pale. The sky began to turn red. They walked to and fro more times than they could count between the dead Aslan and the eastern ridge, trying to keep warm, and oh, how tired their legs felt. Then at last, 
as they stood for a moment looking out towards the sea and Caraparavel, which they could just now make out. The red turned to gold along the line where the sea and the sky met, and very slowly up came the edge of the sun. At that moment, they heard from behind them a loud noise, a great cracking, deafening noise, as if a giant had broken a giant's plate. What's that? said Lucy, clutching Susan's arm. I, I feel afraid to turn around, said Susan. Something awful is happening. They're doing something worse to him, said Lucy. Come on. And she turned, pulling Susan round with her. The rising of the sun had made everything look so different. All colors and shadows were changed that for a moment they didn't see the important thing. Then they did. The stone table was broken into two pieces by a great crack that ran down it from end to end, and there was no Aslan. Oh, 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 cried the girls, rushing back to the table. Oh, it's too bad, sobbed Lucy. They might have left the body alone. Who's done it? cried Susan. What does it mean? Is it magic? Yes, said a great voice behind, behind their backs. It is more magic. They looked round. There, shining in the sunrise, larger than they had seen him before, shaking his mane, for apparently it had grown again, stood Aslan himself. Oh, Aslan! cried both the children, staring up at him, almost as much frightened as they were glad. Aren't you dead, then, dear Aslan? said Lucy. Not now, said Aslan. You're not a... not a... said Sus asked Susan in a shaky voice. She couldn't bring herself to say the word ghost. Aslan stooped his golden head and licked her forehead. The warmth of his breath and a rich sort of smell that seemed to hang about his hair came all over him. Do I look it? he said. Oh, you're real, you're real, oh, Aslan, cried Lucy. And both girls flung themselves upon him and covered him with kisses. But what does it all mean? asked Susan when they were somewhat calmer. It means, said Aslan, that though the witch knew the deep magic, there is a magic deeper still which she did not know. Her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time, but if she could have looked a little further back into the stillness and the darkness before time dawned, she would have read there a different incantation. She would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor, traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. And now... Oh, yes, now said Lucy, jumping up and clapping her hands. Oh, children, said the lion, I feel my strength coming back to me. Oh, children, catch me if you can. He stood for a second, his eyes very bright, his limbs quivering, lashing himself with his tail. Then he made a leap high over their heads and landed on the other side of the table, laughing. Though she didn't know why, Lucy scrambled over it to reach him. Azan leaped again, a mad chase began, round and round the hilltop he led them. Now hopelessly out of their reach, now letting them almost catch his tail, now diving between them, now tossing them in the, in the air with his huge and beautifully velveted paws and catching them again, and now stopping unexpectedly so that all three of them rolled over together in a happy, laughing heap of fur and arms and legs. It was such a romp as no one has ever had except in Narnia, and whether it was more like playing with a thunderstorm or playing with a kitten, Lucy could never make up her mind. The funny thing was that when all three finally lay together panting in the sun, the girls no longer felt in the least tired or hungry or thirsty. And now, said Aslan presently, to business. 
I feel I am going to roar. You had better put your fingers in your ears. And they did. And Aslan stood up, and when he opened his mouth to roar, his face became so terrible that they did not dare to look at it. And they saw all the trees in front of him bend before the blast of his roaring as grass bends in a meadow before the wind. Then he said, We have a long journey to go. You must ride on me. And he crouched down. And the children climbed on to his warm golden back, and Susan sat first, holding on tightly to his mane, and Lucy sat behind, holding on tightly to Susan, and with a great heave he rose underneath them, and then shot off faster than any horse could go, downhill and into the thick of the forest. That ride was perhaps the most wonderful thing that had happened to them in Narnia. Have you ever had a gallop on a horse? Think of that. And then take away the heavy noise of, noise of the hoofs and the jingle of the bit and imagine instead the almost noiseless padding of the great paws. Then imagine instead of the black or gray or chestnut back of the horse the soft roughness of golden fur and the mane flying back in the wind. And then imagine you are going about twice as fast as the fastest racehorse. And then imagine you are going... Uh, and then, excuse me, but this is a mount that doesn't need to be guided. It never grows tired. He rushes on and on, never missing his footing, never hesitating, threading his way with perfect skill between tree trunks, jumping over bush and briar and the smaller streams, wading the larger, swimming the largest of all. And you are riding not on a road, nor in a park, nor even on the downs, but right across Narnia, in spring, down solemn avenues of beech and across sunny glades of oak, through wild orchards of snow-white cherry trees, past roaring waterfalls and mossy rocks and echoing caverns, up winding slopes alight with gorse bushes, and across the shoulders of heathery mountains, and along giddy ridges, and down, down, down again into wild valleys, and out into acres of blue flowers. It was nearly midday when they found themselves looking down a steep hillside at a castle. A little toy castle it looked from where they stood, which seemed to be all pointed towers. But the lion was rushing down at such a speed that it grew larger every moment, and before they had time even to ask themselves what it was, they were already on a level with it. And now it no longer looked like a toy castle, but rose frowning in front of them. No face looked over the battlements, and the gates were fast shut, and Aslan, not at all slackening his pace, rushed straight as a bullet towards it. The witch is home, he cried. Now, children, hold tight. Next moment, the whole world seemed to turn upside down, and the children felt as if they had left their insides behind them, for the lion had gathered himself together for a greater leap than any he had yet made, and jumped, or you may call it flying rather than jumping, right over the castle wall. The two girls, breathless but unhurt, found themselves tumbling off his back in the middle of a wide stone courtyard, full 